All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Wisdom Wednesday. Today we have Dr. Jean-Francois Laberry talking to us about seizures after cardiac surgery. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll talk to the mask. We'll see how that goes. It'll be interesting, and I'll fog some at a time, so we'll see how to make it work. Uh, anyway, so it's not strokes after cardiac surgery, it's seizures after cardiac surgery. We had a little bit of, of uh, fumble on, on communication, that's partly my fault. So, um, Okay, so the outline of today is really to talk about seizures in the ICU and post-cardiac surgery specifically, a little bit on management, risk factors, and obviously the implications for us. I know it sounds like an esoteric, a little bit uh, topic, but it is still something that for most people, uh, we don't really know how to recognize properly and how to treat properly. Okay, so the biggest problem in our ICU is really around recognizing seizures after ICU, in our ICU patients. And this may sound simple, uh, but in reality, they have impaired awareness because many of them are sedated. They're often under neuromuscular blockade and it can be have some pretty dramatic misinterpretation. The classic one I can remember uh, many years ago was a patient with, a, we used to use a, a, a funny sort of pacemaker that was uh, like an NG tube that we'd place in the, the esophagus that would sit behind the atrium. So it was essentially like an NG tube and would pace the left atrium. So it was an atrial pacer that we would use, but at the same time, it used a lot of current. And uh, if you positioned it in a funny way, it would actually cause a patient to have movement of their arms or it would look totally like seizures. And I can still remember being called for a seizure and the patient was trying to grab the NG tube uh, purposefully. So clearly it wasn't a seizure, but uh, it certainly looked like one uh, from the initial outlook. So it's just to illustrate that, you know, our ability to interpret those things are uh, the classification of seizures should still be pretty straightforward. They're either generalized, so they should be movement from all body parts versus partial, which is really a certain segment of the body that's going to move. And unclassified is really not for you or I, I don't think, to diagnose. It's really from neurologist's point of view in terms of diagnosing that. Uh, but some of the time you may require EEG to diagnose seizures, so it can be quite hard. So what are the changes you get with seizures? I put this slide up just to really illustrate uh, a few things. So any thoughts on what kind of things you see after a seizure? What is, what is the classic thing that you guys see or notice? Yeah, so level of consciousness will be down, but is there anything else? There's often some pretty dramatic things that happen after a seizure. Yeah, so temperature. Arrhythmias. Yeah, so arrhythmias. Pressure problems. Yeah, so they can be tremendously hypotensive. Yeah. So tr and they'll have metabolic acidosis, lactate at 10, like it's very dramatic and it's very quick. And often you sort of, geez, don't do a blood gas right away, it'll be terrible. So you're often be post -sictal. So you should, so that means level of consciousness will be affected. So 15 to 20 minutes would be average time that you would require. So it's not surprising that somebody post seizures, you can't wake them up. Like it doesn't matter how much you try, they're not gonna wake up. And so don't be surprised by that. But if you're beyond the 20 minutes and they're still not waking up, so maybe there's something more here. Uh, hypoxia is very common. So there'll be huge ventilatory changes and you'll see their sats are low. They look like shit. They look like they're gonna die. And respiratory acidosis is very dramatic. So there'd be a huge amount of carbon dioxide produced and you'll have trouble dealing with it. So especially an unconscious patient. Lactic acidosis can be very dramatic. Uh, hyperparexia, so temperature you mentioned. Hypertension early, but hypertension after. You'll be inotrope dependent, pressor dependent. You'll be basically losing everything. So it's amazing how much, and often hyperglycemia early, but hypoglycemia late. So again, check sugar is very important. So those are very dramatic changes. And these changes will happen very quickly and you need to respond to them pretty quickly. So it's not just, oh geez, they had a seizure, everything's fine. But the reality is often if you ignore it long enough, it actually all comes back to normal pretty quickly, which is great. So within an hour or so. All right, then PC, cardiac arrhythmias. <laughs> so diagnostic approach at, around seizures is we keep thinking all the time, well, geez, I need a scan and I need an EEG. The reality is it's quite late. That's why I put those at the bottom. You know, you need lots of different things, but those are not it. So my first comment is really spend the time to look at the seizure, okay? You really need to observe what it looks like. Is it affecting one part of the body? Is it start at one hand? Sometimes it'll start in one hand then it'll go the whole arm and then eventually will, so that starts as a myoclonic, so arm movement that eventually can become generalized. 
that gives you tons of information about where there could be something and how helpful it might be. So that's really helpful. Uh, blood sugar is really important because maybe hypoglycemia was the reason you got the seizure, even if you can get hypoglycemia after. I've certainly seen patients, you know, on insulin infusion, stop feeds. Eventually, we don't notice that they get quite hypoglycemic and they get seizure and they're going to die. So that's a, a terrible way of going and that's an easy mistake to make. I mean, we stop feeds all the time and we're on insulin infusion all the time. Somebody who's been on insulin infusion for weeks or months, they've been in ICU for a long time, you might not think of doing the sugar every hour because they've been so stable at five units an hour, for example, for so long. So it's one of those easy patterns that's easy to make. Uh, whoops. So I think a blood gas is quite helpful because it'll show you a little bit of ex-flight abnormality, but don't be surprised you'll be scared by that blood gas. It'll be terrifying. What well, the question is gonna be, repeat the blood gas after to see how it looks. Um, Drug-related, I think, is important because we don't, often don't think, but patients who have been alcoholics or when we talk about delirium or delir delirium tremens in alcohol, this is what we mean, is patients can have seizures from withdrawal from alcohol. That would be the most common and drug-related. Uh, but for us in cardiac surgery, you'll see is transamic acid is a drug we use in the OR all the time, which raises the chance of seizures several fold. So that's really important. And liver function is sometimes helpful a little bit also, because obviously patients who have metabolic problems related to liver disease can actually have seizure disorder. So what's the management? Any thoughts on how, how do you manage? Ideas? Well, stop repeat seizure. Yeah, so you focus, we, our focus tends to be on, one is they tend to be pretty scary. We tend not to like them. We don't like leaving them alone. We want to give them something. But if you're going to give them something, what's the one thing you tend to give most of the time? Adivan. Is that? Adivan. Adivan, yeah. Adivan is great. So that's benzos. So benzos tend to be great drugs for that purpose. So really the first line agent, whichever agent you use, Adivan, lorazepam, clonazepam, and you might repeat that dose more than one time, is really the way to get acutely the seizure down. But often by the time you get the drug, it's already over. But don't kid yourself, you should get the drug because it might happen again. So that's probably a good advice is to have it ready for the next seizure and, uh, and start looking at reasons why they had the seizure after that. Um, if seizure persists, we, most of us will tend to go to phenytoin as the next drug. But phenytoin has some implication from a cardiac surgery point of view because it's a pretty strong negative inotrope and it can be proarrhythmic also. So, you know, there's a loading dose and then a continuous dose. It takes a bit of time to give the loading. And then you often go to 100 milligrams three times a day. It's pretty standard for phenytoin. It's around one gram for most people for loading. Um, and phenytoin is, uh, is, as I said, you just have to be careful as you give it rapidly. You can have pretty significant hypotension. Uh, but most of the time, so we used to, you know, we joked as residents, we used to get one free seizure. The next seizure, you always get that item. The free seizure was the first one. The second one, you never, you always went to dilantin after. The problem is we don't always think of the implication when you go to dilantin from a neurological point of view is these patients will lose their license, will need to get tested, will need, there's huge implications from them once you make it to phenytoin. And they'll have to have EEGs after, they'll have to have a withdrawal time, they'll have, like it becomes a little more complicated and you do need a neurologist involved, even if you think that this is self-limited, will never happen again that's very low risk for anybody. Uh, there are legal implications here that we sometimes don't think about. Uh, and then refractory seizures is really the kinds of things, uh, you know, thiopental I've never used for that purpose, but propofol is a common one. You know, you'll have given phenytoin, you'll keep it on propofol infusion, and you may even use a, a diazepam infusion. So these are patients in status that you can't get out of seizures, you'll use that kind of drugs over time. And that's a problem. Thank God that, you know, status is rare. So seizures after cardiac surgery, we tend to think of the worst things, but the reality is they're often not that common as being the worst thing. They're often relatively self-limited and, and, and I'll show you some of the data, but not entirely. So we think about cerebral ischemia, particular emboli, air emboli, but there are also metabolic derangement, drug interactions and drug withdrawal as major causes of this. So, so it's not just bad things that give you seizures. So don't necessarily panic if somebody who's fully awake, look perfectly normal, you're about to exhibit, they get a seizure, they're like, oh my God, something terrible happened. You know, 20 minutes after they may be back exactly to where they were, you're still gonna extubate them. The question you're gonna be asking yourself, is it gonna happen again? That's always a hard one to deal with. And I put this one here, is uh, it's just to remember that I, we use transamic acid. We've reduced the dose of transamic acid over the years. 
Uh, there, uh, you may remember about 15 years ago, there was a trial that was called the BART trial that was assessing three different antifibrinolytics. And that's a drug that's used in everybody for heart surgery to prevent basically the breakdown of clot that leads to more bleeding. And so every patient uses transamic acid currently. But in the past, we used to use Amicar, transamic acid, or aprotinin. Those were three drugs that were available. And there was a big trial looking at that. And the protocol in that trial used transamic acid in very high dose. And so the incidence of seizure in that particular group was over 10% of patients. It was super high. So in that particular trial, I mean, 10% is very high. We don't see that much. So the real incidence of seizure is probably around 1%. So one out of 100 patients, we do 900 patients here, you're going to have about nine patients a year or 10 patients a year that will suffer a seizure after surgery. So it's not that common, but it tends to lead to lots of questions. Uh, it tends to occur early, so you're not going to see that late. It usually happens half of it in the first 24 hours. Most of them occur in the first two days. So it happens quite early. And you may miss really early because they'll be on propofol, for example. So they might have been having seizures due to the CF. And the majority of seizures, you know, three quarters of them are generalized, as you can see here, 71%. Very few are status. I've only in my lifetime seen one patient with status, and that patient actually survived, but he was in seizures for four days in a row. Like, he just never got out of seizure. It was unbelievable. And that, I never thought he would survive that. But eventually, you know, his brain cleared, and eventually he made it home. So it doesn't mean that everything was normal, but he at least was able to survive and get better. And so... It's pretty impressive. So what are the kinds of procedure that leads to seizure? It's very rare after cabbage surgery. And part of the reason for that is cabbage surgery is really not surgery that goes inside the heart. We don't open the heart itself. We stay on the surface of the heart. So the way, and, and opening the heart is very important because once you open the heart, it means you introduce air you introduce particulate, you introduce little things that can actually embolize and can actually affect your brain. So anything that involves surgery within the heart, potentially at higher risk. And even the higher risk than that is aortic surgery, which really carries the most risk because aortic surgery means that you're operating on the blood vessel that has all the branches that go to your brain. So you're much more likely to affect certain things. So that's really important. So, the burden of seizure, having said all of that, that even if I said that you know half of the patient who suffers seizures don't have a stroke, it does mean that half of them probably have some small or big neurological problem. So their hospital mortality is about five-fold higher than normal. So if we think somebody coming for heart surgery has a 2% mortality, somebody who has a seizure, their mortality risk is higher. There's something not right about them, even if they fully recover. Uh, and they do have higher incidence of major complications postoperatively, not necessarily because of the seizures, but the patients who have seizures tend to be higher risk aortic surgery, higher risk procedures, they're more likely to have complications. Uh, and sadly on CT, as you can see here, is that the ability of CT to detect anything abnormal is very, very rare. So, I mean, not very, very rare, but it's about a third of patients you're gonna see something on CT at any point in time. So many patients will have seizures. You'll never be able to find a cause per se or an actual defect or something that helps you. So if you looked at survival of these patients over time, once they made it out of hospital, patients who had no seizures obviously have a better long-term survival. The curve obviously stay high up, close to 90 to 100%, while patients who've had seizures obviously are a higher, different risk group of patients. They're more likely to die over time. Uh, so that's, uh, pretty obvious in itself. So, so what are the risk factors? So when you take all those variables and try to put it in a statistical model, you can find that there's, you know, it's not about age or diabetes or those other things. These are the actual factors that are independent of others that will actually show you a higher incidence of seizures. So deep hypothermic circulatory arrest is always used for aortic surgery. It means you have to stop circulation in the entire body for a period of time so you can fix the vessels going to the head. Extensive aortic calcification and atheroma. So when we come back to the, from the OR and we say, oh geez, I was worried about that patient. There was a lot of calcium on the aorta. That's what we mean. Our concern is that there's something we missed or we'd not be able to pick out that put that patient at risk. And then critical preoperative state is just somebody who's in shock, who's quite sick early on, would have a higher risk. And so those are the independent risk factors. And what I mean by that is, you guys know what an odds ratio means? It means it's seven times the risk 
compared to somebody normal. This would mean three times the risk compared to normal. So that's what an odds ratio does. And it gives you an idea of the magnitude of that risk. So if you have deep separatist arrest for every dissection, we tend to use it. Whoops, your risk is seven times. The next slide I put up is what's the role of CT imaging? Well, the reality is the CT imaging is terribly not useful in seizures. It's very useful when you have focal findings, but the majority of patients with seizures, you're not going to be able to find something useful, even if we end up doing it often. So we have a seizure, we tend not to do a CT right away. We wipe and see, we give dilantin, we try to settle it. But the next morning with like the LGs, we should look, we should make sure we get a CT, we get neurology involved. The reality is unless there's a focal finding, meaning I can't move my left arm or my left leg or my right arm, I, I've got a droopy face. So those are focal findings. Once you have a focal finding, CT is very helpful at finding a defect. If you don't have a focal finding, very hard. Okay. So in overall, to wrap this up a little bit, is that you know, the incidence of seizure is still low, around 1.2%. It can be a marker of cerebral injury. The same as delirium, even if we think of delirium as an organic brain syndrome, it is still a marker of brain injury. It's a sick brain. Uh, I think these patients are in increased risk um, uh, if you operate in, in any procedures that goes into, into the cardiac chambers, either valves or aorta. And then finally, the reality is that these are subselecting patients that are higher risk for having poor outcome, obviously, because they're higher risk patients, they're less likely to do well over time. All right, I think that was all for the, uh, so I made this a little bit short, which is good. And uh, so it didn't matter for the beginning. Any questions? Uh, I have a patient that's known, uh, what, it's known, it's known procedures, would you, would that roll them up for any kind of cardiac surgery? No, so good question. So, so patients who have underlying, you can put the lights on. So patients who have underlying seizure disorder, basically all it means is they're a higher risk of having a seizure post. But generally we'll try to make sure we give the medications early, we try to use them, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't deny somebody's surgery based on it. Yeah, absolutely not. And many patients who have seizure disorder tend to be quite stable. They're not, they're generally patients, oh geez, I had my last seizure one year ago or three months ago or that kind of stuff. The ones that are a little bit harder are the ones who have liver failure or liver problems. So a little bit of, of, of cirrhosis, but not very bad, who then have a major aortic surgery. Those are the ones that you worry a little more. So liver dysfunction, potentially using transamic acid, and then you have an aortic surgery, that risk of seizure is not 1% anymore. It's you know, five to 8%, that kind of range. So those ones are your little, but you're not going to give that lantern prior. You're going to wait and see, and then you'll just deal with it as it comes. Deal with it as it happens. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Are you still there, Sue? Yes, I was just curious if um, you had started a patient on Dilantin, and we never really figured out why the patient had seizures in the first place. Do you send them home on Dilantin? Yeah, good question. That, that's sort of what I was alluding to before, is the neurologist will generally uh, have a minimum three months of Dilantin, which means for them that they'll have a follow-up EEG, and then they'll withdraw their license for that period of three months to make sure that they're seizure free for that entire period. And, and then, uh, then it gets a little more complicated on how they get rid of it and whether or not they, they get their license at that time or they wait another three months. Yeah, that's a big deal for a patient. Yeah, it's a huge deal. I, the reason I remember that, I, I was never aware of that until I, I had a young patient, you know, not completely healthy, 40 year old, had an aortic valve and had a simple one time seizure after surgery. And Frick, he wanted to kill me because he couldn't drive for three to six months. <laughs> wow, <laughs> he, was, yeah. he was very, very, very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> you can Thank imagine. you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great.